All right. Wow. Thank you, everybody, for joining in today. And uh, we have uh, gathered here to discuss uh, about this entire concept of study abroad. And uh, very happy to be doing this series on popular demand. Yes, a lot of students and a lot of parents have been reaching out to understand this entire process of you know, applying for universities. What does it entail? How does one need to go about it? And that's when we conceptualized this entire idea of study abroad series. Uh, this is, of course, the first session, the introductory session, and uh, we will be deep diving into the finer nuances of study abroad, like appearing for SATs and ACTs, cracking those interviews, writing your SOPs and LORs, uh, you know, understanding financial aids and scholarships, understanding why is it important to do research internships and summer programs, and a lot more. So yes, you are in for a very, very insightful series. And at Elkhorn International School, we take pride in the fact that a lot of students have been placed uh, at some of the finest universities abroad. And it is just our effort to ensure that their juniors who are now very, very inspired, learn from this entire series. And as parents, you all have some concrete takeaways. Uh, just a small fun fact, which I would like to share before we move ahead. We had done a small poll on Instagram where we spoke about what are the preferences these days. And uh, if I can just share the results, you'll be happy to know that 66% uh, people voted in for international universities, uh, which clearly uh, gives us a fair idea about what the youth is thinking, uh, what are their choices looking like, and uh, therefore this entire series becomes more and more relevant. Um, without any further ado, let's move on to understanding today's session and who this session is going to be taken by. Uh, extremely happy once again to present uh, Mr. Ananj Prasad, the founder and managing director at Skillsphere Education, who have been our knowledge partners for a very, very long time and has always been a very productive association with them. Uh, Ananj is a gold medalist engineer from Mumbai University and an Ivy League graduate uh, from Cornell University, USA. Um, Ananj has, uh, you know, his, his, he founded Skillsphere Education with the sole objective of uh, imbibing 21st century skill sets in young individuals. And uh, he is now heading Skillsphere Education, which, is, which has become the Asia's largest skill-based uh, skill set development organization. And he is a mentor to over thousands of students, not only in India, but is now establishing his footprint in the Middle East and America also. So Ananj, thank you very, very much for always helping us and for always being our rock solid support when it comes to uh, you know, great initiatives for students and giving them all the wonderful insights. It's as always a pleasure to have you. And I'm sure the parents and students are gonna have some concrete takeaways today. Over to you, Ananj. Thank you so much, Suganda ma'am. It's an absolute pleasure to be conducting today's session as always conducting sessions, sessions at Elpro International School is a privilege. And being a part of the extended fraternity at Elpro International School, I'm always very happy to be speaking to the parents, students and diverse demographics belonging to the school and the extended fraternity. I believe we have a lot of members um, today in this group who belong to different schools and have been very enthusiastic to understand more about the entire concept of studying abroad. Well, I am going to be starting off my presentation and I will explain the entire flow of the session. I'll introduce myself. And uh, the session is going to involve a little bit of interaction since we are a huge group of 290 individuals today. Um, it is not going to involve as much of one-to-one -one interaction as group interaction by uh, means of raising hands. I hope most of you know how to raise your hands on Zoom. That will make it much easier to go through certain aspects of this entire presentation. More importantly, at the end of the session, we'd have a Q&A and I'm very happy to address every single question that you might have. I would like to tell you that I'm actually laying the foundations as the first speaker in the study abroad series. I'm laying the foundations for a lot of different things that a lot of different counselors and eminent personalities over the next few sessions will come and say to you. And I'm sure that a lot of you have been very inquisitive about this entire concept of studying abroad and what goes into it, considering the fact that on three, at 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, you'll have found the time to be a part of today's session. 
So let's not waste any further time and let's quickly jump into today's session. What I'm going to be talking to you all about today is the way ahead for developing the right skill sets. All right. Yes, the ACTs, the SATs, the letters of recommendation, your extended essays, and everything else with respect to studying abroad are very, very important. But honestly speaking, um, all of those aspects form a part of the end process of your application. Okay, the means to reach the end process properly is what I'm going to be touching upon today. And I am going to be talking about a lot of aspects and through the process of these aspects, I will actually uh, make you go through my entire journey of uh, being a graduate from an Ivy League university. So I mean to give you a little bit about my experiences as well as the importance of some of these skill sets, right? So this is of course today's session. And um, as ma'am has already mentioned, um, I run this organization called Skillsphere Education. A lot of students at Elpro International School would surely be acquainted with it. We conduct a range of 21st century skill-based programs for students in over 340 schools and colleges across Asia, which focus on the development of skills like public speaking, communication skills, general knowledge and awareness, critical thinking, problem solving. And we do a lot of events like model UNs, quizzes, debates, and the works. So honestly speaking, what we are trying to focus on is making students the best versions of themselves. And when I talk about myself, well, uh, I completed my schooling in Mumbai. I went to Mumbai University where I pursued my chemical engineering. I finished off from university as a gold medalist was something that was a great honor for me. And um, I started off Skillsphere Education, post which I took a short sabbatical, completed my master's at Cornell University USA before coming back to continue the growth of the organization in 2016-2017. So I have um, had the opportunity of getting exposed to multiple education systems both in India and abroad. And more importantly, um, being in the field of education, I do study a lot of things that go into being a good student, right? So we're gonna be talking about all of these things. And if I'm to really define myself, I would define myself as a passionate teacher motivated entrepreneur in the field of education, and most importantly, something that I hope all of you become, which is lifelong learners. So let's quickly jump in. I'm gonna to start today's session off with a very interesting question. I've asked this in the past as well. Um, I want all of you seated here. I believe that we have a very diverse audience with respect to age groups. We have a few parents as well. Um, I'm, but I wanna ask you a simple question. I'm gonna basically be um, majorly customizing this entire session for students of uh, higher school, but each of these aspects is also very fitting for students of grades four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right. And in fact, the earlier you start, the better it is when we talk about skill sets. So I want all of you to imagine that uh, you have applied for your dream university. Uh, for most uh, students, when we talk about dream foreign universities, it's typically an Ivy League university, though it need not necessarily be the case, or an Oxford or a Cambridge or a King's College in uh, Great Britain. So I want you to imagine that you have applied for your dream university. And just for the sake of it, let's assume it's Harvard University. Okay, Harvard University is definitely one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Let's imagine that you have applied to Harvard University and you are absolutely brilliant with your academics, you're brilliant with your co-curriculars, you're brilliant with a lot of different things, and uh, you've done extremely well in all of these SATs, ACTs, your board exams, everything is perfect. When we're talking about the I IBDP, um, you're a 100% score student, so all of these things are perfect for you, okay? So you're basically on this whole dream journey when it comes to being a student. Every student wants to be like you because you're just so good academically. So you clear all the rounds of the application process as well quite easily. And um, you're now in this final round, okay? You've already made it to the university, you've made it to Harvard University, but now you're in this final round, which is for a scholarship. Now, one of the things that we often don't realize is that studying in some of these foreign universities can be very expensive, all right? On average, an undergrad degree in a good college would not cost you anything less than $40,000 to $50,000 a year. That's on the lower end. It's a lot of money. And obviously, we in India and everywhere across the world, try and look for grants, try and look for scholarships. So in order to get into Harvard University, where you have applied, you actually need to sit for a scholarship interview. Okay, and this interview takes place with the Dean of Harvard University. Let me tell you, the acceptance rate to a university like Harvard is less than 1.6%, which is really, really small, all right? And for a scholarship, well, you can probably make it 1% uh, or 1.6%. 
So that's really a low number of people every year getting a scholarship. But you have made it to this August group who is being interviewed to potentially get a scholarship. And you go into the dean's room. All right. Before that, you've prepared everything related to the field of study. You've spent 15 days cramming every single academic book, everything possibly that you can see around you. Okay. So you've done all of this and you come and sit on the chair for the interview. You're expecting to be asked a bunch of questions related to science or mathematics or history or geography. And you have every answer in your head. You're ready to spurt it out as soon as you're asked this question. But interestingly, this dean doesn't ask you any of these questions okay the dean says let's assume i am the student you assume you're the student okay so dean says look aranj i know you're academically brilliant i've already read your resume i've read your essays you write well you obviously know a lot of different different things so there are no two ways about it that you know you're a very smart and proficient student so i'm not going to ask you anything related to your academics i have just one thing to ask of you and that is dazzle me. Okay. So the Dean says dazzle me. This is a very interesting thing for those of you who probably do not gather what dazzle me means. Dazzle me means to surprise me, astonish me, make me feel amazing by sharing something about yourself that is so different from others or just so amazing. All right. So the Dean says dazzle me. That's all that the Dean says. And here you are sitting in this once in a lifetime scholarship interview, trying to understand how to dazzle the dean. All that you have studied for this particular interview is really of no use because you never really thought of this kind of a question that could be asked. Okay, so I want all of you to think of this scenario and tell me that if you were put into this scenario, how many of you believe that you'd be able to dazzle a person? Just raise your hands on Zoom. All right, we have one hand, we have two hands, three hands, four hands, quite a few hands going up. Right? All right, I'm giving everybody a little bit of time. We have roughly 20 hands that have gone up. All right. I'm going to ask one of the students. Yes, Abhas, go ahead. How would you dazzle this dean? You can unmute yourself, Abhas, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, go ahead. So I think first of all, it's an amazing question that has been asked. I mean, dazzle me, this question is probably the question that I believe I am the most prepared for. I think I have something that is very different from everyone else. Everyone can wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning. Everyone can open a book. Everyone can read it. Everyone can learn from the book. Mm -hmm. But I believe I possess the skills to understand and apply the knowledge that I gain from my surroundings. Not only apply them like everyone else, but to apply them in my language such a way that they benefit me, not only academically, not only go curricularly, but also financially. I know how to capitalize on my skills and having the ability to understand and, you know, having the ability to capitalize on what I know. I think that is one skill that sets me apart from everyone else who can learn and who can, you know, speak about anything, but uh -huh. having the ability to capitalize on my skills. I think that is one thing that's, you know, just sets me apart from everyone else. All right. Thank you very much. Let's ask another student. Yes. Yashashri. Yashri. I'm sorry. Would you like to say, would you like to share with us how you dazzle a person? I have allowed you to unmute. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Go ahead, Yashri. Okay. Sir, I think I am capable of dazzling the dean because I, my thought process is different than others. I believe that everybody has capacity to do something different. Everybody has something special about themselves. Uh -huh. And that is the thing which dazzles others. For uh -huh. example, I am an avid reader. So uh -huh. the dean can be dazzled by anything. I mean, 
I like reading, so I could have a good vocabulary. The dean can be dazzled by it. I have a great, I have a great knowledge about some other thing. So the first, so the dean can be dazzled by it. Anything. Uh -huh. There are many aspects to a person. By which a, by which a recruiter or a dean or anybody can be dazzled. All right. So, all right. Yes, Rashid. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. We are a very, very big group of uh, individuals, so I'm not going to be able to give everybody an opportunity to speak on every question. But thank you so much, Avash and Yashasri, for sharing your different views on this question. This is actually a very deep question. It seems very simple. Often when put in the spot, a lot of us tend to um, you know, be unsure of what to say or how to say it. And honestly speaking, when you're put in this kind of a situation, there is no right or wrong answer. Yashashri talked to us about many things that can potentially be things that dazzle other people. But more than having a particular skill, it's about how you present it. Your ability to express yourself with confidence and conviction and to be able to build a story and be able to convince a person and astonish a person requires skills that go beyond the basic hard skills that you possess and that's what we're going to be talking about in a little further detail today so this is my first question to you and i'll tell you where all of these questions are leading the next question that i'd like to ask you all is apart from covid 19 okay apart from covid 19 can you think of five things that have taken place in the world in the past week and how they have impacted you no news related to covid 19 can you think of five things that have taken place in the world in the past week and how they have impacted you? Nothing about oxygen cylinders, oxygen beds, unfortunate cases rising, falling, lockdowns, unlocks. Can you think of five things? Think about it for a second. And more importantly, don't simply think of five things. Think of how they have impacted you. And as soon as you're potentially able to think of five such things, please raise your hands. We have two hands that have gone up. We'll give everybody a minute more. One hand that's gone up. Two parts to the question. Five things and how they have impacted you. Right? 30 seconds more. All right, 15 seconds more. All right, yes, Abhay, you want to go ahead and share what are the five things you thought about? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Probably mm -hmm. three or four more uh, most uh, important things. First mm -hmm. is, uh, in uh, Champions League, Chelsea won the cup, which was I'm like I'm a hardcore Chelsea fan since last twenty years. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, Ericsson got uh, heart attack on the field, which was yeah. affected. He was one of the uh, Tottenham player, ex Tottenham player. Mm -hmm. uh, US has uh, declared multi-million trillion dollars economy boost which uh -huh. was i wish we could have something in india uh -huh. uh, next one you showed on the screen israel has attacked uh, attack uh, palestine uh -huh. which was uh, which was a crazy thing during uh -huh. this this uh, this period uh -huh. and the last one is europe has opened up uh, most of the countries uh -huh. I wish we could have visited those, but uh, our situation is comparatively like not good at this stage. So these are the couple of things. Okay, I I can't say about the one lab which was close to COVID. Otherwise, right. I would have mentioned that that was a human-made thing, which I don't want to talk. Thank you so much, Abhay. That's very neat. Very, very impressive. A uh, lot of variety of news. You talked about the unfortunate uh, collapse of Christian Eriksen yesterday. Luckily, he's safe. A match between Denmark and Finland. You talked about how Chelsea's won the Champions League. It made you feel happy. The multi-million dollar stimulus package by the United States of America and a bunch of other pieces of news which are great. I'll give one more student an opportunity. Yes, Ankita, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Um... 
Uh, the first news that I want to talk about is that Sonu Sood has started um, an organization to help people prepare for UPSC. Mm -hmm. And um, Shubho Paul um, uh, is a footballer from India who got selected for an exchange program internationally. Um, uh, then we have um, uh, Megha. I, I can't recall the surname right now, but she has, she's a journalist who's won, in, uh, won a Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. And um, Kim Jong-un uh, has restricted uh, regulations against K-pop because he thinks that, the, uh, that um, he's losing control over his people. And um, then Windows has uh, launched, win uh, is, has um, announced that they might release um, Windows 11 quite soon. And Windows 10 will be, um, uh, will stop getting any updates in the year 2025. Um, how these news have impacted me is that I'm interested in, um, since I'm a humanities student, I'm interested in becoming a, jo a journalist or, um, and uh, uh, the civil services is also one of my prospects. So this is how they've impacted me and all of the other people have inspired me. Um, so, such as Megha and uh, Shubhapal. Megha, uh, Megha Rajagopalan is the name of the Pulitzer Prize winning Indian journalist who's covered the entire issue of the Uyghur Muslims and their mistreatment by China. So thank you so much for that, Ankita. Thank you so much, both Abhay and Ankita. Um, there were about five or six hands in this entire group of 333 that probably went up when I asked this particular question. Megha shared a lot of different pieces of news with regard to whatever has happened in the world, different pieces of news uh, good variety of them as well, quite positive. Thank you so much. I'm sure it's been enlightening for everybody. But let's quickly go on. And I have one last question to ask you before we jump into the entire context of why I'm asking you these questions. I would like to ask all of you and be very honest about it. In a group of five people, if you are the only one with a different opinion from the others, how confident are you of expressing it? In a group of five people, if you're the only person with a different opinion, and everybody is very loud about their opinions, if you're the only person who has a different opinion, how many of you would be confident of expressing it? Right, I can see hands slowly going up, count going up. We have 18, 19, 20, 25. Right, think about it, right? 30, I'll give it 10 more seconds to see how far we go. Mm -hmm. All right, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so 40 in 336 people mentioned that they are confident when it comes to raising their opinions in an environment where everybody else has a different opinion. Students, parents, all of you who have joined me today, the reason I've asked these five different questions is because they're fundamental when it comes to higher studies and especially studying abroad because these fundamentals focus on the importance of very, very basic 21st century skills, which are continuing to become more important in today's times. There are some very astonishing facts that I'd like to tell you about. Well, glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking, is one of the most widely seen fears in the world. It's only second to the fear of death. And unfortunately, more and more students today seem to suffer from glossophobia in spite of having good communication and conversational skills because of growth in media and social pressures. Another fact is 95% of the people in the world cannot answer that current affairs question that I asked. Okay. Uh, here too, we had only five people who were able to think of five things that have taken place in the world in the past week. And what's more astonishing is that 99.5% of the people cannot answer the second part of the question wherein I asked, how does a particular piece of news impact you? And this is round about the exact number of students who are not able to answer this question either. It's actually a research statistic by Harvard University itself. And it was carried out on a sample size of 100,000 students. Most were not able to think of five things that have taken place in the world and how they have impacted you, okay? And lastly, 98% of the people in the world cannot speak about themselves for anything more than 18 seconds. Now, you know, these facts are not being presented by me to scare you. The objective is not to scare you. But what I'd like to tell you is one more important fact that I'd like to tell you is that the World Economic Forum recently conducted a research which stated that most technical skills and academic skills are expected to get outdated once every 10 years because of the technological advancements or the growth of artificial intelligence, robotics, and in general, 
through this period since 1950s, post World War II, there have always been these phases where different professions and different academic skills and technical skills continue to get outdated. We need to keep upgrading them at very rapid paces. And with technological advancements, it is becoming even more important. But one thing that does not get outdated, irrespective of how forward technology moves, is soft skills and 21st century skills. Skills like clear communication, listening skills, overall public speaking, assertiveness, digital literacy, financial literacy, communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, each of these skills are becoming more and more important, all right? And it's not simply becoming important from the perspective of development. When I share my experience with you, what I'd like to tell you is that honestly speaking, all my academic skills did matter when I went to Cornell University for sure. That's something that each one of us is anyway focusing on. But what mattered more than anything else was all of these 21st century skills. And these skills cannot be developed simply before you start applying for university. You know, it's not about a process where you start preparing for an SAT or an ACT and then you just start preparing for these skills on the side. This process needs to start much earlier in school itself through a plethora of opportunities both in school and beyond school. Because each of these skills is what is going to be helping you adapt to university life, especially abroad. One of the questions that is often asked to me is, you know, what is the difference between life in an Indian university and life in a Western university? Well, um, I've spent life in both these environments and what I can clearly tell you, going to one of the best universities in the world at Cornell as well, is that the biggest difference lies in the approach to education, all right? The approach to education in the West is with due respect to Indian universities, more inquiry-based, more collaborative, and more open-ended. It requires a lot more effort from the student to explore and create your own journey within university. The options that you have are limitless in many universities, not only with respect to academics, but also co-curriculars and extracurriculars. So having that conviction to be able to explore different things becomes extremely important. The ability to interact with different people, the ability to work in group environments, the ability to present our opinions without being scared of what other people think of us, all of these skills are extremely important and must be developed from a much younger age itself. When I was at Cornell, I was a member and I was actually the president of different groups at Cornell University, which probably were uh, the highlights of my time at university. While education was great, the campus was great, each of these circles and networks that I developed through my time at Cornell is honestly what made my time at university stand out. And if you'd like to enjoy that experience, well, you definitely need to work on your university application process, but you need to work a few steps before that on the development of your 21st century skills and your soft skills. And honestly speaking, um, these US universities, British universities, Australian universities adapt quite quickly. While India is also adapting with the national education policy that's come out, these universities, because they don't work in many cases with a centralized mandate, they tend to adapt very quickly. And the importance of these 21st century skills is something that is starting to reflect in multiple ways in a lot of these competitive examinations, the extended essays, and the interview processes, all right? So while, yes, if you do want to study abroad, you must develop these skills, try and develop these skills from your own long-term betterment perspective. It's very important. And of course, we keep trying to propagate this at Skillsphere Education. We cover a small area of 21st century skills, but there's a much larger packet that we'll be talking about. And you need to start looking at it. And as I told you, this is exactly why in the world I'm sharing all of this with you. But you know, when you go even beyond universities, uh, the reason due to which these 21st century skills are important is I'll give you three very practical examples of corporate life, all right? I hope that a lot of you end up taking leadership positions in school. Um, as well as beyond that in whatever other environments you are in. And I hope this eventually culminates in you taking up leadership positions when you take up very, very big jobs, whether you start off as entrepreneurs, start your own businesses off or work with an Apple or a Google or some of these top companies. Well, if you are in a leadership position, yes, your technical abilities are definitely going to be mattering, but it does not 
at the end of the day discount the fact that you have to interact with people you know if you are in a situation you are going to be giving presentations you are going to be motivating your uh, group of uh, juniors you are probably going to be speaking to the press at times as well and if you are in these kinds of situations you don't want to be feeling like this gentleman is feeling here you don't want to have the chills you don't want to have the sweat you want to be able to present yourself without worrying about anything and having the conviction in yourself similarly irrespective of whatever you decide to do whether you decide to become a sports person or an engineer or somebody in the armed forces or somebody working in a tech environment at the end of the day what's going to be very important is you have to be able to work in cross functional environments with teams okay it really is not about your own individual abilities you have to be able to maximize the team's abilities and work as a good team worker and in those kinds of situations you don't want to be dropping the k like this person has dropped you don't want to be dropping on in your team it doesn't matter matter how academically proficient you are in fact when we come to university as well trust me when i say um if you really want to excel at university you have to be able to make a team work um there will be probably just three or four assignments in an entire semester for every course which are individual almost every single assignment is a group based assignment almost every single assignment all right and you are going to be working with people from diverse um geographies from diverse cultures especially if you go to a foreign university so it's very important to be able to adapt all right it's not simply about the way you want to work but you have to be able to adapt to the way other people work all right and the last point that i'd like to tell you about is this entire concept that's called the imposter syndrome okay a lot of us suffer from the imposter syndrome wherein we feel we are not good enough all right and this entire thought process typically start setting in when we are 13 14 15 years sometimes even younger where we see somebody better than us at something but we feel that we are not good enough at anything all right we start questioning ourselves we start questioning our, abil our abilities and all of these things eventually culminate in us not doing something well enough so we really need to work on ensuring that we don't suffer from such a kind of a syndrome called the imposter syndrome and need to start putting in that effort wherein we develop that confidence and conviction in ourselves and the younger we start the better it is and for all students who are probably in grades 11 and 12 it's very important that you make use of every single opportunity younger the better but grades 11 and 12 especially especially important of course the ibdp systems i believe this is being organized by the eis ibdp section the ibdp division does provide you with a lot of different uh, opportunities as a part of your curriculum through cas and everything else so does cbse but it's very important that you utilize them not only because your curriculum requires you to do so but because you want to build yourself as a personality you will not suffer from these issues and will be able to express and emerge all right so school years are very crucial as i've always mentioned uh, there are opportunities that go way beyond simple academics honestly i feel one of the biggest advantages of being in a school is that you have everything available under one roof all right if you want to learn a particular sport you do have the opportunity to find people to play it with if you want to learn a particular instrument you probably have the opportunity to get that basic exposure at least if you want to participate in different events on stage whether it's dance competitions music competitions public speaking competitions quizzes model un conferences we have all of these things available under one roof and utilizing these opportunities becomes so important there are different activities there are different clubs there are different competitions and of course internships which are now afforded to students of grades 11 and 12 as well so being able to utilize each of these opportunities is going to play a very big role in ensuring that you're skilling up all right and each of these skills start mattering more and more as you grow older lastly i'm going to just touch upon a topic very briefly which is going to be talked upon in a lot more detail next week when profile building for grades 11 and 12 students is discussed but the ability to build your profile by exploring a range of different activities disciplines whether it's social networking skill building too each one of these things can happen in a very seamless manner with a lot of support and mentorship during your school years all right so when we really talk about 21st century skills there is an entire packet of skills which are considered 21st century skills if you really ask me to be honest i think uh, the word 21st century skills is just an in word you know it's a fashionable word to talk about when you talk about education today but each of these skills is very important in any century 
it's just becoming more important because of that fact related to the world education the world economic forum how you know hard skills and technical skills are getting outdated but skills like communication creativity collaboration curiosity empathy leadership digital literacy financial literacy and the works are super important all right how do you develop these well there are a bunch of workshops of course which are available today the schools offer a range of such online workshops a lot of extra curricular activities of this sort as well a lot of offline workshops also keep taking place now a lot of us often participate in these from the perspective of receiving a certificate what i'd like to tell all of you is that you know the certificate doesn't really matter uh, when you apply to university taking the example of model un conferences i always say this to students it doesn't matter whether you have participated in 25 muns or you've participated in two okay what matters more than anything else when you're writing your statements of purpose is how you have grown as an individual how you have grown as an individual through participation in different activities all right numbers never really matter the diversity matters equally much okay people are wanting to see how diverse you are as a person all right i know of cases where there have been students who have been brilliant at science come up with ex with uh, experiments and come up with journal articles which have also won them awards in genius olympiads which are global competitions but because of a lack of diversity in their portfolio just one uh, track in nature they have missed out on certain applications in spite of being academically brilliant so it's very important that you expose yourself to a lot of things especially those things that you're scared of take this as an opportunity to expose yourself to those kinds of <coughs> disciplines those kinds of extracurriculars so please do that you know whether it's through school or a lot of other online workshops or a coursera or a udemy try and explore and develop different skills in fact for students of grades 11 and 12 there are a lot of different courses on coursera and udemy that are being developed by some very notable universities in the world whether it's a stanford or it's a carnegie mellon there are a lot of different courses see some of the courses you are interested in and try and actually take them up that's not only going to help you build your profile and your portfolio but is also going to help you when you move further into university when we talk about studying abroad another thing that i'd like to tell you is that you know the initial process of settling in and adapting is a little stressful it does take a little bit of time to adapt i won't say stressful but it can be a little overwhelming because we are used to a system of education that's slightly different all right we are used to receiving everything that we need to study going and studying it and coming out and probably attempting a test related to it the us system of education is slightly different what takes place in the us system of education or the british system of education is that they'll give you the topic you need to read about it and then come back and have a discussion on it all right so it's very open ended and most importantly it focuses a little bit more on the application of learning so being able to apply your learning and being able to apply it in different groups at times does take a little bit of time it does take a little bit of time but in due course you adapt to it so being able to do this already through different courses through different competitions is definitely going to be very very helpful all right so try and expose yourself somebody asked me about upgrade it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter which side which course but each one of these things are definitely going to help a lot more when it comes to studying abroad all right and of course with 21st century skill development for younger students of course there are a bunch of opportunities that exist there are a bunch of opportunities that exist through different competitions and clubs start taking those with grades 11 and 12 start finding those all right explore now there are also a lot of competitions that take place inter school at a pune level or at a mumbai level or at a state level national level international level whether it's cultural arts competitions like dance music singing or it's model un conferences and debates or it's quizzes or it's sports a lot of coding activities and a lot of tech robotics based championships have also come in now i know a lot of Uh, students often scamper to try and participate in these competitions it's great to participate in these competitions once again from the perspective of receiving a certificate and probably an even an award but what i want to tell you all is that the correct approach to participating in these competitions is also to develop some of these 21st century skills these are perfect platforms to develop skills like communication like collaboration like networking 
because you get to meet and interact with so many other individuals more importantly it teaches you the importance of hard work of patience of perseverance each one of these skills gets developed in a very progressive manner so when you participate in all of these competitions try not to participate simply from the perspective of getting something to tick mark on your resume try and look at each mun for example that you participate in model un that you participate in as an opportunity to improve your ability to convince and persuade others or your ability to analytically write draft resolutions better when you participate in a football competition try and use that as an opportunity to build your teamwork and your collaboration when you work on coding competitions try and use that as an opportunity to improve your application of knowledge so each one of these skills and the perspective from which we come just one second please i'm so sorry there's a flight going over so each of these skills and the perspective from which we approach them becomes very very important all right so um i think there's a very golden thing that i learned at cornell one of my professors told me um is that the end does not matter as much as the means so the process is probably the most important part of any puzzle so when you are participating in each of these different activities try and look at the process don't try and jump through the door try and walk through the door with all those skills all right each of these is an upskilling opportunity for students of grades 11 and 12 another opportunity that you must definitely explore a lot of students have started exploring that in a much much bigger way in the past few years and opportunities are opening up especially since we have gone online is internships now you don't actually pursue an internship in grades 11 and 12 simply to earn money in fact honestly speaking there are certain aspects of indian law which make it illegal to pay students below the age of 18 but you must definitely pursue an internship to get exposure in fact don't try and pursue a single internship try and change your internships every couple of months so that you get to explore different fields whether it's tech fields or arts fields or teaching fields or social service fields there are a bunch of different organizations which are offering internships to students especially in grades probably even 10 at sometimes but grades 11 and 12 where you get to work with different people you get to understand what the work entails a lot of us think that we want to become chemical engineers or we want to become economists but honestly speaking when we actually understand what the work entails at times we feel like we made the wrong decision probably back in my times we did not have the opportunity to explore all of these different avenues through internships today you do and that will give you a much clearer picture a lot more exposure a lot more perspective and definitely a lot more confidence and conviction to take decisions moving forward and these internships are not the kinds of internships where you need to work from 9 to 5 you can simply be a person an unpaid intern who's working for experience probably you get a certificate and a letter of recommendation as well but you work for 1 hour or 2 hours a day or you work for 4 hours a week where you just get that basic exposure okay that's something that's really being propagated and it's being a part of it's becoming a part of certain curriculums as a part of cas in ibdp because i believe this is being organized by the ibdp sections yes internships in different ways can also form a part of your cas projects right so internships definitely do matter and try and work on them lastly and most importantly what i'd also like to state is build your profile okay profile doesn't mean your side profile or your front profile of your face because that's typically how we relate to this word it's about building your exposure to different things all right um, as i mentioned don't stick to one thing try and expose yourself to multiple different disciplines try and do all those things that you're not so comfortable about doing while in school or in college okay try and look at those things just expose yourself to those things it'll help you know uh, provide that level of diversity for your application process as well as provide you with that opportunity to see whether you might end up liking something um when i went to cornell um i actually took up drama and theater it's something that i'd never taken up in my life but i actually um took up drama and theater and realized how much i love it and if you start doing those kinds of things at this age itself it is definitely going to help you a lot more okay it's definitely going to help you a lot more so try and build your profile it's something that the next set of speakers are definitely going to speak about a lot more as well what i'd lot also like to mention is that today with the growth of social media and technology um the entire ability 
to interact with people from different disciplines different corporates has really grown all right and i know a lot of you spend the time on linkedin i'm sorry spend time on facebook and instagram but one of the social media sites that i'd strongly urge all of you to explore a lot more is linkedin okay linkedin is frankly a no nonsense social media platform it's a platform where people uh, from different fields of work speak to each other and share ideas talk about developments in their particular fields talk about what they have done talk about how they are growing in their professional fields it's a professional social media network so it's very important that you probably explore what different people say about different fields i have my linkedin uh, profile it's called ananj prasad you can always connect with me or follow me i always like to speak to students but just like me there are hundreds of other people who are very happy to speak to individuals who are students a lot of these professors from these larger universities whether it's a cornell or a harvard or any of these universities are also on linkedin and are always very happy to interact with students apart from all of these people there are always ceos there are cfos there are leaders from different fields you can always ask them about the prospects of the field how did they go about things so it gives you an opportunity to get information from the horse's mouth first hand information which can be utilized in so many so many different different ways all right so all the time that you spend on social media if you can start shifting that time from facebook and instagram first make a linkedin profile all right you can write that you are a student in a particular school you don't need to have a detailed profile like i have that's something that will keep growing you keep updating your profile but join linkedin as a learner to follow people and learn from them all right just spending some time speaking to these people will really help what i'd also like to tell you is that often um, you know we are a little skeptical about asking questions right we are scared of how the person we are asking to a question will actually respond to it um, but one of the things about studying abroad is a lot of these professors are extremely approachable personalities and frankly they love speaking to students all right so if you actually try and get in touch with them via their email ids where you write to them they'll probably respond or definitely via linkedin you can try and comment on one of their posts and ask a question or you can drop them a linkedin message and you more times than not will probably get an answer it's one thing that i'd like to tell you one of the skills that's very important is to be fearless when it comes to asking questions all right that's always going to help and clear out a lot of doubts there are a lot of people who claim that they know a lot about these universities but trust me they probably don't know more about these universities than the people who are either studying there or who are teaching there so definitely go through those different different processes all right beyond this what i'd like to tell you before i start entertaining questions is uh, number one one key takeaway that i had from cornell is you don't need to be the first ranked individual in your class to be able to get into cornell university or into one of these ivy leagues i i'm a part of the ivy league networks of the world as well as india and i can tell you there are people with some of the most diverse backgrounds possible honestly speaking uh, we feel, might feel like you know we are the top ranked individual in our particular board of study but there are so many different people from different boards of study some from the most uh, impoverished nations of the world who uh, have really worked very hard to come up to where they have and it's all been about their diversity their diversity with skills their diversity with respect to profile and their ability to be go getters it's very important that you work on being a go getter and basically clinch every opportunity that you have at your disposal and of course academics are important but skill set development is equally important all right skill set development is equally important and i think dhwani one of the students i had interviewed from elpro international school a couple of weeks back mentioned how you know she probably went about that entire process of application herself and she was not the top ranked student in her school at many points in time but she was able to do well in academics while increasing her profile abilities everywhere else and she's found herself to go to harvard and stories of this sort are in abundance so don't simply focus on your academics but also focus on overall development in grades 11 and 12 it will really really help so those were my two bits of information for all of you and uh, i'd be very happy to address a few questions before we move on i've gotten a few questions on message if anybody would like to ask me a question about my experiences or about the basics of 21st century skills how you can go about them profile building or just the application processes in general feel free to raise your hands or you can also ask me a question on zoom chat i've gotten a question from atul 
Uh, you spoke about the different style of instruction in the UK and USA. Is it challenging for Indian students to adjust when they go there? Are students ready to go for undergraduate courses? Well, thank you for that question, Atul. Um, well, students are definitely ready to go for undergraduate courses. In fact, uh, the ability to adapt would probably be much easier in the undergraduate levels because a lot of time is spent on orienting students for it. At master's levels, it totally depends upon how you grasp that opportunity and how you take it up. There's a lot more orientation period in undergraduates because it goes on for four years. So the first year, the freshman year is spent in the entire process of uh, you know, orienting students. And in fact, students don't even pick the degree that they want to pursue in most cases in year one. It's a very open-ended field where you can take up a bunch of different subjects and pick your degree or interest by year two. So yes, it is possible to adapt. It is challenging to an extent because we have to get out of our comfort zones and from our traditional ways of learning. So it totally depends upon our adaptability. adaptability. Students typically are able to adjust within a month or two, homesickness taken into consideration as well as soft skills. But uh, what's very important is also to be adaptable. Okay, those students who are not adaptable are probably the students who are not going to be able to do well in those universities. Okay. So that's my answer for you. Another question was, can you list some of the sites that offer internships to students? That Dhriti has asked. Dhriti, you can go on to internshala.com and uh, look for internships. Internshala is a good site for internships. But apart from that, honestly speaking, more than looking for those internships, um, just see what field of uh, uh, work are you interested in. Look for people who are in that particular field on LinkedIn and ask them directly. Don't be scared of asking. Ask them whether they offer internships, unpaid internships to students of grades 11 and 12. That's the best way to go about this. All right. That's what I'd like to say for this particular question. But you can go on to intern, Shala. All right. Anaga asks, sir, can you name a few organizations who offer internships for 11th graders? Well, there are a lot of organizations. Honestly speaking, a lot of media organizations, right from some of the bigger media organizations and channels offer internships. A lot of educational organizations like Skills for Education. In fact, we had floated a form, I think. Recently, we had shared it with Elpro as well. I think Suganda ma'am mentioned that she had shared it. We have a few students from Elpro who are also pursuing an internship at Skillsphere. There are other educational organizations, basically, that offer internships for external collaborations, for... Uh, uh, content development, even engineering and tech and coding organizations are happy to offer internships of times. Okay. One student has asked me IIT versus US universities. Uh, honestly, it's like comparing apples to oranges. All right. There's no comparison. It totally depends upon what you want in life. And at the end of the day, some IITs are also brilliant universities of learning. But yes, their process is different from that of US universities. And it totally depends upon what you want to gather from it. All right. So honestly, I wouldn't, I don't think anybody is qualified to decide which one is better. Well, I went to Cornell University though and I had a whale of a time. I had the most amazing time of my life, the one year that I spent at Cornell. All right. A question on chat is, can you explain the process of application? All right. I'll explain the process of application in brief. And honestly speaking, this will be a part of the study abroad series. So each session is actually going to be covering a different part of the process of application. But the process of application honestly starts off with building your soft skills and profile like I've mentioned. The first thing that you'll require is stuff to put onto your resume, stuff to put onto your profile. So start building it up as early as possible in life because all of this is really going to help. But post that, the formal process requires you to shortlist universities, give your competitive exams, whether it's the SAT or the ACT. You're going to have to probably give one of them. You definitely have to give the TOEFL as well, right? You have to give that. After that, there would be extended essays for different, different universities. Um, you'd have to get letters of recommendation. And then you have to go about the process of application. Post that, uh, well, if you'd like to apply for scholarships, well, uh, that's also at your disposal. So to put it, to cut a long story short, that's really the process. And it typically should start off in 11th standard, grade 11 where you start building your profile at the minimum and shortlisting universities, and it picks up pace by the end of grade 11. You should be complete with your applications by the September or October of your grade 12 studies, okay? The counselors for uh, GRE as well as other, uh, I'm sorry, for SAT as well as other study abroad degrees will be coming in the next few sessions. We'll share and shed more light on it, okay? Riti asks, what are the options for masters after BTEC course? 
there are abundant opportunities for BTech courses, whether it's in engineering or it's in uh, engineering management or in MIM degrees. There are a bunch of uh, different different opportunities that exist. Just give me one moment. I'm sitting in my uh, on my terrace. There seems to be a little bit of pandemonium via birds. My sincerest apologies. Uh, somebody asked me what was my area of specialization at Cornell. How did I arrive at this choice? Well, I did my master's in energy economics and engineering, and I did my minors in early childhood education. Uh, how did I arrive at this choice? Well, I was a chemical engineer by, pro by qualification post my BE degree, and I was definitely very interested in exploring the field of energy engineering and environmental engineering. Uh, energy economics and engineering tended to blend in aspects of economics plus energy sciences beautifully and in fact the course was beautiful so i decided to take that up it was under the department of chemical engineering i had a minors in childhood education from cornell because i run skills for education and i further wanted to refine my 21st century skills but what i'd like to tell you is that when you go to universities especially at an undergrad level you have the opportunity to build your own degree there are a prerequisite number of courses that you need to pursue in your area of concentration, but I have actually pursued all kinds of courses, right from uh, learning how to uh, play ice hockey, um, to learning drama and theater as a one credit course, to a bunch of seminars related to tech and science, to, um, I mean, honestly, you won't even think of the kinds of courses that exist at times and what you can learn. Just the fact that a course of that sort exists is mind boggling. But I'll take a live question at this point in time. Ronak, would you like to ask me a question? Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I know this might sound a bit strange, a bit odd, but would you not mind um, telling me, because I'm really intrigued to know um, the most difficult challenge of your time in Cornell, uh, which has helped you reach to this great level? All right, thank you, Ronak. Doesn't sound weird at all. That's a neat and very intriguing and interesting question. Um, well, uh, I'm still on the part to greatness is what I'd like to believe. But um, yes, uh, we are doing well at Skillsphere. And honestly, uh, when I was at Cornell University, I was running Skillsphere remotely from there. So my entire team was working from here. And uh, I had to work on two different time zones. Honestly, I was working uh, through the nights in India on my course at Cornell. And uh, that was day in the US. And when it was night in uh, the US is when I used to spend some time with my team. So that was quite challenging. Uh, when I talk about university, one of uh, the biggest challenges was honestly, I was spoiled for choice. And this happens with a lot of students. So you don't really know what you want to take up. And there was this particular time when, you know, we had to take up only 17 credits per uh, semester. You could take up a maximum of 32 and I took up 33 credits. So uh, <laughs> it was a little challenging to complete all the assignments and everything associated with it, but it was a great character building exercise. So it's important to uh, you know, be very conservative and be realistic when we decide what we want to do at times. So yeah, that's really what I'd like to tell you. Thank you, Ronak. All right, so Jata, go ahead. Um, so sir, uh, what do you think about volunteer op opportunities right now? I think they're absolutely brilliant volunteering whether with social service organizations or with any other organization is going to provide you with a bunch of perspective and opportunities which go way beyond putting those things into your resume so you must definitely pursue every volunteering opportunity you possibly can Sujata. right yes hardik would you like to ask me a question yes yeah, sir uh, uh, i i had had a question that uh, where uh, where would you suggest uh, me to do 11th and 12th in India or abroad? All right. Um, are they honestly, I don't think there are too many people qualified to answer that question for you. I don't think I'm qualified enough either. But uh, I do believe that uh, pursuing your 11th and 12th uh, grade studies in India is not going to impact your ability to study abroad in grades I mean, for, for university, I mean, it doesn't really matter as much. Yes, with uh, certain students from certain countries, especially students from China and students who do not read the English language well enough yeah. or do not speak the English language well enough, there are people who actually go in much earlier to the United States to study mm -hmm. from our grades 10, 11, and 12 itself. But uh, honestly, for Indian students, 
it's not going to make much of a difference if that's what you're asking me. I have a couple of friends who actually went in at grade 10 levels and then pursued their undergrads in the US. All right. I'll take a couple of other questions. Uh, I'll try and answer five more questions because we are running out of time. Yes, Tanaya, go ahead. Um, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is it? Do you, what is the value of an engineering degree that is taken in India versus what is taken abroad, specifically for somebody who is a U.S. citizen? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that are taking taking an taking a degree abroad is more beneficial if you are a U.S. citizen than what you would take in India? Well, it totally depends upon where you want to settle down. Actually, um, definitely, if you're a U.S. citizen and you want to go back to the U.S. Uh, a U.S. engineering degree will matter a little bit more. At least some kind of exposure in the United States of America will matter a little bit more. Also, the quality of your degree definitely does matter. But frankly, if you study in India, getting a job in India should not be difficult. It depends upon the geography, as I said. Often. Yeah. Shashank, I'll entertain one question from you and I'll try and see some of the questions that are being asked. There are over 42 questions, so it'll be difficult. But yeah, Shashank, go ahead. Right, Shashank, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Oh uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, uh, sir. Like, what was your motivation, and how did you, uh, you know, like push yourself uh, towards this? All right, to go into Cornell University. Is that your question? All right, I'll answer that for you. So basically, um, frankly speaking, both my parents are masters holders. My father's a master's from IIT Bombay, and. Uh, my father's actually a master from Clemson University, went to IIT Bombay, and my mother's an MBA from Allahabad University, and both of them wanted me to pursue my master's. Initially, <clears throat> I was very skeptical about pursuing my master's because I'd already started off my own organization and it was doing largely well, so I didn't want to move uh, out of India you know, for a sabbatical because I didn't know how it would affect my uh, uh, organization at that point in time. But uh, I did take this uh, step, I did apply, and I always wanted to, I decided that if I go to a university, I probably want to go to the best. So I'd only applied to Cornell University and Carnegie Mellon. And luckily, I got into both of these universities. I'll try and answer a couple of uh, questions that have been asked here. Uh, well, I put in my application for Cornell without a study abroad counselor. Um, it's very straightforward if you go through the different, uh, there's a lot of information available online as well as when you speak to people. So I just found it more convenient to go about the entire application, my pro process itself. And um, I was very motivated once I started applying to just learn the process of application. I thought it was a very interesting process. You know, the process of application should not be approached simply from the perspective of getting into a university. It's actually um, something that's very enriching. So I really enjoyed that. And uh, once I got into Cornell University, of course, uh, you know, a lot of us think that being an Ivy League graduate uh, has uh, a lot of boasting rights and bragging rights. Well. Let's face it, it does, but that's really not what Ivy League graduates gain the most. The exposure in the university is just unbelievable. It's amazing the number of people, the kinds of professors and students you get to meet and work with, the opportunities for studies, and it's probably impossible to replace anywhere else. So I really miss it, um, and I would very strongly recommend that you all try to go to the best universities possible, because trust me, you know, college life is the most amazing time uh, for anyone, and it's very difficult to replace, if you ask me. Uh, in a breath, I'd be ready to go back to Cornell if I got the opportunity to study a little bit more, right? Um, so, well, that was my answer for you. Let me just try and quickly scroll through a few questions. Uh, should we do diploma and then complete our BTEC in Canada? A lot of these questions, honestly, that you all are asking, uh, how to prepare for the SAT exam, um, you know, which courses should you possibly take? Some of um, the people who are coming next week and the next week after, will be really able to answer even better. So I would not like to take that opportunity away from them. I can answer them for you, but it'll be better if they answer it for you. Uh, the best medical universities, well, there are amazing medical universities in the US, which have worked on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, as well as in uh, Britain, where they've worked on the AstraZeneca vaccine, as well as in India, where Covaxin has been worked on as well. So it's difficult to, you know, honestly, there's nothing like a best university. Uh, what I'd like to tell you is that these university rankings that exist, uh, even though Cornell is the number seventh ranked university in the US and the number 14th ranked university in the world. What I'd like to tell you is that they're an absolute hoax. Okay, let's face it. Uh, so um, it's very important to understand that all of these rankings are based on past uh, uh, perceptions of a lot of things. 
So it's important not to go by them seriously. It's important to go by the degree you want, the environment that you want to be in, and of course, the exposure that you're getting. And the IBDP curriculum really, really provides you with this kind of an opportunity as well, because you get to explore the way of uh, you know, learning that's followed in the US systems when it comes to picking your subjects and picking your disciplines. So that really helps to an extent. And of course, other degrees help too. But since this was an IBDP section uh, program, I thought I'd mention that. Social work experience definitely has an impact on your applications, Urvi, but definitely it has an even bigger impact on yourselves. Okay, so you definitely must pursue it. Building a profile, I've talked about certain aspects of it, Yash, and you can build on that. What is the policy of financial aid in IVs? Does Harvard give all the students who get selected aid or according to their situation? Well, it's according to merit and situation and additional applications and essays, Prakar. It's kind of difficult to get scholarships or even part financial grants for larger Ivy Leagues. I did get a 40% grant. Um, and then I went on to pursue what uh, you call uh, an assistantship, okay? I was a TA, I was a teacher assistant there. So I was able to cover a large part of my fee, but uh, it's difficult at times to get this. What was my grade 10 and 12th percentage? Honestly, it doesn't matter. I don't even remember my grade 12th percentage. My grade 10 percentage was I think it'll be laughable for you all now, but it was a good percentage back then. I was among the toppers in Maharashtra. I was a 95 percenter and 12th, I think something like 91, but it didn't really matter in the larger scheme of things. Yes, being academically good is important, not being a topper. Okay. Uh, what is the minimum age to go abroad for studies? They're just in standard four now, are there? Papa, you can go as early as grades eight, nine, and 10. All right. You can go in for your high school studies or you can decide to move into uh, any um, country and probably pursue the educational systems. But at this point in time, Adya, the key takeaway from this particular uh, uh, session for you is the importance of building your skills. And if you're in grade four, you have a much larger window to develop your skills and expose yourself to different, different environments. Do that because by the time you reach in grade 11 and 12, it'll make life much easier for you. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, Honestly, there are just so many questions. Uh, all right, I'll end with one question. I'm so sorry if I've not been able to address a lot of questions. What I'll ask is, all right, there's one student who's continuously asking me this question, is abroad more good than India in studies? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think India is better, abroad is better. It totally depends upon what you want and uh, what, uh, position, I mean, what direction you want to take your life to. Um, but exposure is great, honestly. If you'd like to get a little bit of exposure, I'd always suggest that you probably spend some time studying abroad or at least getting some kind of exposure abroad. It really helps, all right? So uh, let me just see if I can ask, all right. I'll ask, I'll allow Anaya to ask a answer. I mean, ask me one final question. Anaya, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so, sir. So my question is, um, is taking a gap year after 12 beneficial for uh, applying into Ivy Leagues and like improving your extracurricular activities so there's a more chance of getting into Ivy Leagues? Well, um, that's an interesting question, Anaya, the whole concept of a gap year. Well, I myself am a gap year student. Uh, I was actually applying for the IITs post grade 12 and uh, I did get in, but I got a very low rank even uh, post my gap year. So I wasn't really able to uh, get chemical engineering, which is why I went to Mumbai University. Um, the gap year was very good for me because it gave me an opportunity to, uh, you know, get my head back on my shoulders. Post grade 12, I was really flying. You know, I had lost that basic humility essential to do anything well in life. But that gap year gave me a lot of perspective, gave me a lot of exposure. I pursued a couple of internships as well while continuing to study. That's my experience. Well, a gap year does not necessarily provide you with the opportunity to improve your profile, though. It's always important that if you take a gap year, you're taking it while taking your parents into confidence and with a very clear cut objective and direction. Otherwise, a gap year can be a large waste. Taking or not taking a gap year is not going to have a large impact on your university prospects, though. All right. So uh, that's Kavya. No, I did not study uh, abroad in grade 10. I studied abroad for the first time post my undergrads, which was during my master's, all right? But the study abroad experience is something that you can definitely, definitely gain uh, while in India. If you really want to gain 
a first hand experience of uh, the study abroad experience to some extent well the ibdp curriculum does offer you that if you'd really like to look at that because uh, the entire system of learning the ibdp learners profile each one of these things definitely play a very major role in helping you and adapting you know we talked about adaptability well if you adapt into the ibdp system it does make the process of adaptability into the systems in the us uk or australia much much easier so in that perspective you can definitely gush by copy pasting the question i'm not going to answer it all right so don't do that but anyway you know there are some students who are sending the question again and again uh, but anyway uh, that's really what i'd like to tell you uh us unis do provide undergrad for law cornell has a great law university harvard has a great law university bunch of others as well honestly i'm just going through any question that i can possibly see at this point in time um how to choose a degree and at what time is one question that has come in well uh, honestly speaking this is something that you all need to go through yourself it's a process of self reflection to decide which degree you would like to pursue um in undergrad studies an interesting thing is that you do not need to actually opt for your major when you apply you can apply for a university and apply and pick your degree in the second year so it does give you the opportunity for exploration but those internships workshops curricular activities definitely give you a little more exposure okay uh some courses that would help you build your college application every single course could possibly help you with what i'd like to tell you is try and take up multiple different courses okay um uh, i was not a student of the ib program uh, some some person has asked well because back in my times the ib programs were not so well established i come from mumbai i grew up in mumbai and the ib programs there were just a couple of schools that provided the ibdp curriculum so i actually completed uh, my grades 11 and 12 in cbse though right if that's really the question you want to ask how much does it cost on average to study abroad taking everything into consideration the average per year cost would be around 45 to 50000 dollars for um ivy leagues and others it might even go up to 70 80000 dollars per annum totally depends upon the degree you take all right uh, students parents i've tried to answer as many questions as i possibly can and i'd love to probably get a transcript of all these questions and try and address them separately and i request suganda ma'am to probably share it with all the attendees today but i'd really yeah. like to thank everybody for the opportunity today before i hand it back to suganda ma'am the key takeaways from my uh, presentation are firstly try and answer those three questions that i asked in the beginning dazzling me try and dazzle yourself firstly try and uh, speak about yourself for 5 minutes try and amaze other people by talking about yourself second question is always try and have an answer for the five things that are taking in place in the world and how they impact you and thirdly try and develop that confidence to be able to express your opinion in groups even if everybody else disagrees with you okay this is just the beginning of some of the skills that are super duper important irrespective of the university you get into in india too but definitely when you're studying abroad try and build your profile for yourself okay not university application or future job oriented but try and look at these internships courses workshops any and every possible exposure look it's not simply about you know i am into public speaking mun quizzing and uh, basic 21st century skill development there are also technical skills technological skills that are important social skills art based skills basically do everything possible to broaden your outlook and expand your horizons to make yourself a very very valuable 21st century skilled citizen all right and lastly and most importantly if you really ask me what's required to get into some of these best universities so called best universities i'd like to say it's really trying to be the best version of yourself so try and focus on being the best version of yourself because none of these universities believe in the concept of best right so uh, thank you so much for this opportunity on a sunday afternoon and i do look forward to interacting with you all soon once again